Yo guys, what is up? Here we are with another reading video. And today, we are going to be reading chapters 17 and 18 and Mil Milkweed by Jerry Spinelli. So, I today do have a book suggestion. I know I have not been doing this lately just because when you when you're in Battle of the Books, you read the same books over and over and over and over and over and over and over. So I ran out of book suggestions. Uh, today's book suggestion is Martian by Andy Weir. It is a book about an astronaut who is stuck, who gets left behind on Mars accidentally, and he has to survive and eventually get back to Earth. Really good book. Should check it out. And depending on what your parents or what you as a teacher want, uh, you should probably consider the classroom version or the real version. I like the real version better, but some people may like the classroom version better. Okay, that is all I've got, so let's get right into it. Milkweed by Jerry Spinelli, Chapter 17. Suddenly, everybody was living with Yuri and me in the stable. Enos the Grim-Faced, Kuba the Clown, Ferdy the Smoke Blower, One-Armed Olduk, Shoeless Big Henrik, Gray, Unspeaking John, and, other, and others, boys who no one seemed to know. We stick out like purple turds, said Enos. He said that since the rest of the Jews went to the ghetto, the boys can no longer blend in with the street crowds, and there's finches everywhere. What's finches, I said. People that tell the jackboots where Jews are hiding. I'm glad I'm not a Jew, I said. He gave an ugly laugh. Ugly laugh. Don't worry, the ghetto is for you too. I hear they take gypsies and cripples and crazies. If you want to be safe, be a cockroach. There must be a finch. There must have been a finch around because one morning, as we were sleeping in the hayloft, the door flew open and voices shouted. We scrambled like cockroaches, but jackaboos were everywhere. One of the boys jumped from the loft. He was shot in midair and flopped to the ground floor like a rag doll. They marched us to the ghetto. Since they had finished the brick wall, topped with broken glass and coils of barbed wire, I had not been able to visit Janina. I took this as a personal insult and challenge. I had never been kept out of any place I wished to be, and I had no doubt that I would soon find my way to the other side of the wall. Still, I wasn't too, I, I wasn't too proud to be grateful that the escorts were making it so easy. Something else occupied my mind even more than the march. Yuri. He wasn't with us. When the jackboots rousted us in the stable, he wasn't there. This was not surprising. In recent weeks, Yuri was often gone, sometimes for days at a time. With his red hair and I belong here in visibility, Yuri believed that he would never be seen as a Jew. He was fearless on the streets. Also, he believed he was much smarter than the jackboots. I always knew when Yuri was about to disappear. He would put his fist under my chin and whisper between clent clenched teeth, Don't let me hear. He meant that he had appointed some of the boys to finch on me, if I did something especially stupid and silly. I think he would have been surprised to know that I actually heeded this warning as much as I was capable of heeding a warning. For some reason, I felt freer to be stupid and silly when he was here than when he was not. It never occurred to me to worry about Yuri. I believed he knew everything and could handle anything, but, prodded along by the jackboots rifles, I did wonder about him. Where was he? What was he doing? What would he think when he returned to find the stable empty? I did not wonder if he would find us. I knew he would. Instead of the, si of a, the sidewalk, the jackboots marched us down the middle of the streets. Horse wagons and automobiles made way for us. People stared. We're a parade, I thought. But for this, the parade, the people. But for this parade, the people were not silent. Bye, bye, you little snots. Over the wall with you, filthy Jews. I didn't bother to tell them I wasn't a Jew. On one street alley, we marched along the trolley tracks, and here came a trolley headed right for, heading right for us. We hesitated. The jackboots shouted. We continued. We did not stop. The trolley did. Then, with a clank and a clang, it began to move backward, and that is how we went down the street, the trolley backing, us, backing up before us as we marched on. Soon, we turned onto another street, and there was the wall. To left and right, it went on forever in both directions. The bricks were red and the sky was brilliant blue. The knots in the barbed wire sparkled like ladies' earrings. A yellow bird landed on a curl a queue of wire, stayed for a moment, and flew off. We came to a gate in the wall. The guard opened it. We marched through. 
The jackboots stayed behind. One of them b bowed deeply. I didn't understand that he was mocking us. I bowed back. He kicked me in the rear and sent me sprawling to the ground. The gate slammed shut. I made a beeline for the Milgram's apartment. When you need to open the door, I announced, I live in the ghetto now. Just what we need, said Uncle Shepsel, another neighbor. I didn't see Janita's mother and father. Where are your parents? Janita told me that her father had been taken out of the ghetto and out of the city t t on a work detail. Her mother was sewing uniforms for jackfruit soldiers in a Warsaw factory. Only people with work permits were allowed through the gates and the wall. Let's go outside, I said. We bolted from the apartment and ran down the stairs. Uncle Shepsel shouting, Wear your armband! It was cold and bright outside. We ran about the courtyard like let loose puppies. Uncle Shepsel's voice came down from the window. Your armband! We ran to the street. Why don't you wear your armband? I said to Janina. Why don't you? She said. I'm not a Jew. Well, I'm just a little girl. Who cares about a little girl? She twirled about. Besides, we live in the ghetto now. We're safe. We ran down the street. To my eyes, this side of the wall looks much like the other side. Crowds of noisy people, even the fox first riding the shoulders of the rich lady, seemed as if they might speak at any moment. Everywhere people were selling things, calling out, Mirror, mirror, unbroken, beautiful pictures, three for the price of one, toys, toys, hairbrush, cheap. I saw one boy with an, I saw a boy with one arm. Oleg, I cried. Out. We ran to him. Oleg squinted at us, shading his eyes with one hand. Oleg has one arm, I said to Nina. She punched me. I can see that. She turned to Oleg. What happened to your arm? Oleg looked down at his right shoulder. For a moment, he seemed surprised to find the arm gone. He frowned. Train, he said at last. Janina reached out. Don't be sad. This one is good. This is Janina Milgram, I, pronounced proud I announced proudly. She is my sister. It just came out. Oleg looked at her, but he did not smile. We all looked at each other for a little while, then went our separate ways. Later, we saw a gray, unspeaking John. He was sitting in the sidewalk, his back against the ripped wall of the bombed-out building. Hello, John, I said. John did not seem to hear me. His eyes were closed. He's sleeping, Janina whispered. But then one of then but just then one of John's eyes op fluttered open. This is Janita Milgram, I said. Janina held held out her hand. Hello. The eye closed. I whispered in his ear. He doesn't talk. Janina pulled me away. Let him sleep, she said. I raised my voice as if he were far away. She's my sister. As we walked away, I said to, I said, John is gray. He's sick. Gina said, why do you tell them I'm your sister? I'm not your sister. I shrugged. I didn't know. Before we about got, got back to Niska Street, we heard squeals and shouts down an alley. A knot of children was withering on the ground. Suddenly, one of them, a boy, popped out of the knot and came running towards us. As he sped by, I could see that he clutched a potato in his hand. Some of the other children raced after him. The rest dragged themselves off down the alley. Gina looked looked at me. What happened? Unlucky orphans, I said. I told her that that was what Enos called them. Orphans who did not live in Dr. Korzak's home or any other, and who ro roamed the streets hungry and begging and sick. Be glad we're not unlucky orphans, I told her. Is, is Gray John an unlucky orphan, she said. Oh, no, I said. He's, he's a lucky one. He's with us. Winter. Chapter 18. Yuri had found us by our first morning inside the wall, but now we saw even less of him. Do you go to the other side, I asked him. Do you have a work permit? Don't ask, he said. One cold day, Yuri and I were on the street. I was wearing two coats, but I could not make my feet warm. There were many people. I saw a boy. At least I thought it was a boy from his size. He was lying on the sidewalk. I wonder how could he could sleep with all the noise and people. It was very strange. He was not in a doorway where I've often seen people sleeping. He was not even on the edge of a sidewalk. He was right in the middle. The people just walked around him, making the shape of an eye. It was also strange that no one seemed to see him. No one tripped over him. The strangest thing of all was the newspaper. It covered him like a blanket. Yuri, I said, that boy is stupid. The newspaper can't keep him warm. Nothing can keep him warm, said Yuri. He's dead. We st we, we were stopped, looking down at a dead boy. Let me start over. We were stopped, looking down at the dead boy, the only ones not walking by. Why is he dead, I said. Did a, did a jackboot shoot him? Erie shrugged. Maybe. Or food. 
or the cold, or typhus, take your pick. What's typhus? A sickness. Very popular. Unlucky orphan. Yeah. He pulled me along. From then on, I saw dead people under newspapers every day. It was easy to tell the children. Only one page was needed to cover them. One day, I asked Yuri, Why are they covered with newspaper? So no one can see them. But I can see them, I said. Yuri did not answer. Then I saw one of them become seen by a man. He stopped in, in front of one. He put his foot down on top of the hump newspaper and tied his shoe. The same bodies were never there two days in a row. But there were always new bodies in new places. Sometimes the feet were sticking out from the newspaper. And the first days, the feet always had shoes. Then they stopped having shoes. Then the socks were gone. And then I, I wondered who put the newspapers over the bodies and who took the bodies away. I thought, angels. And that is the end of chapter 17 and 18. I'm not going to continue on to chapter 19 because chapter 19 is a long chapter. So I hope you guys did enjoy this video. If you did, make sure to leave a big fat thumbs up, comment down below, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I'll see you guys in the next video.